I am ready. So let's get this show on the road. I am absolutely delighted today to be um, presenting uh, to you two of the Student Center Learning Research Collaborative's favorite scholars. Um, my name is Eric Tosalis. I'm the Research Director for the Student Center Learning Research Collaborative. Um, and today um, we have the fortune of having uh, Dr. Marisa Saunders and Dr. Jorge Ruiz de Velasco to co-present on some of their really important and recent work um, having to do with how we use, how we think about, how we allocate, how we distribute, uh, and how we deconstruct current usages of learning time in order to better serve many of the equitable outcomes we seek to achieve. Um, I'll briefly introduce our two speakers today, and then I'll describe a little bit about the format and flow of the day, um, and then I will kick it over to um, our two presenters to talk about their work, and then we'll finish with some time for question and answers from those who are attending the webinar today. Um, so quickly, introductions. Um, Dr. Marisa Saunders is currently a member of the Annenberg Institute for School Reform's research and policy team. Um, she's long been serving the fields of education as a researcher, as an author, as a change maker, um, as a leading public intellectual in thinking about a variety of issues. Prior to her work at Annenberg, she was at UCLA's Institute for Democracy, Education, and Access, where she led a number of research projects that focused on college access and identifying promising approaches to high school education. Um, she is also, and I'll make sure that I'm getting this in frame, the author or the <laughs> co-editor of one of my favorite books about one of my one of the issues I think that is most important in the 21st century, if not previous centuries, and that is moving beyond <laughs> tracking and ability grouping regimes. This book, I highly commend to all of you. It's fantastic. It's a great survey of the needs in the field, even though I suspect you're seeing, oh, no, it shows it in the right way. So Beyond Tracking by Harvard Ed Press, co-edited with Jeannie Oates. So a prop there. Um, and then uh, this uh, other folk that's joining us is Dr. Jorge Ruiz de Velasco, who is also an advisor to the Student Center Learning Research Collaborative. Um, uh, Dr. Velasco joined. He is currently the Associate Director at the Gardner Center at Stanford, has been in that position since 2013. Before that, he was at Berkeley Law, where he was the Director of the Warren Institute's Program on Education Law and Policy. He, too, is a leading national figure in thinking through issues of and implications of education reform for disadvantaged students and how law, policy, pedagogy, and structural features in our society cohere to affect pathways for students. Um, and we're delighted to have both of them here to speak. Um, I want to highlight one other thing. The two of them are co-editors in a fairly new book from this last year called Learning Time in Pursuit of Educational Equity, published by the Harvard Education Press. And much of what they'll be talking about today can be covered in much more detail in that fantastic new book that came out in November of 2017. So it's hot off the presses. So uh, with that, I'd like to again thank our two presenters, and I will give it to them to take the wheel. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, Eric, thank you so much for that introduction. It's um, a real pleasure to reconnect with uh, familiar faces from, from the, um, the fellows program, and uh, I'm really happy to, to, to be able to join you guys today. Um, I, I know that this is part of a series, and, and then in, in um, your ongoing learning, um, you have spend a lot of time in discussions about different barriers to student-centered learning in your work or how it manifests in studies that you're doing. Um, those um, barriers often relate to the structural features of schooling, um, uh, such, you know, things like the fact that we expect that learning happens at school, that the learning happens through didactic methods of teach students and see teachers uh, in front of a classroom, um, the barriers and opportunities that new technologies uh, present for any time, anywhere learning, and the cap the cap and our sort of lagging knowledge of how to build capacity to use those technologies uh, effectively. Some of the other um, barriers relate more to the way that our accountability structure really has dictated a really narrow uh, conceptualization of learning that bears particularly strong 
on young people in low-income um, uh, neighborhoods. These are largely the way that test-based accountability privileges uh, reading, writing, and mathematics. Um, the the way that it, it particularly in low-performing school learning is then constrained around these core subjects, um, leaving little time for the things that we know um, animate and support uh, deeper learning, um, social emotional learning, and, and uh, other kinds of enrichment activities. Um, th these include things like English learners uh, can't have access to the, the, the broad curriculum until they master English, or that kids who are struggling in mathematics can't have access to um, uh, deeper learning in, in mathematics until they've mastered uh, certain operations, all of which sort of cuts against um, what research says is uh, the, the way kids learn. Today, what we're going to uh, focus on, Marisa and I, are time as a resource, as a, both as a barrier and as a resource for, uh, for learning, uh, for teaching and learning, but also as a disruptive force um, that, that helps to address some of the structural features of schooling that get in the way of student-centered learning, as well as our often narrow conceptualizations of, and ideas about learning itself um, that have constrained um, progress towards our vision of student-centered learning. Um, and uh, so we're, we're, we've been looking at, at projects that really <laughs> the notion that that uh, student, that schooling and learning needs to be all, only from eight to three, um, that learning stops after three o'clock, that, that the year should be nine months, that the, the, the year should be 280 days, uh, and so on. So, so we wanted to uh, look at um, ways um, that different people were, were challenging this um, box of school and schooling as being the, the driver of, of learning for, for all kids. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, five um, familiar intervention models. They're, they should be, they're likely to be very familiar with you, so I won't go into their particulars. Uh, and then Marisa will pick up on the theme of how these approaches add to our um, understanding of how kids learn. Um, I did want to start, uh, because we're researchers, with a little data point. Um, we um, started our exploration in this work um, looking at the growing disparity in uh, educational investments and in outcomes that began to grow uh, between um, high wealth families and low wealth families um, in the mid-70s. Uh, by 2006, um, we found uh, through demographers and, and economic studies that wealthy families are now spending about $7,500 per year more on their kids' expanded learning opportunities beyond school, uh, beyond 9 to 3 p.m., than, um, than, uh, low, lower, than, than, than on kids in lower income families. So if, for example, you are and, and these are things like after school sports, dance, music, tutors, mentors, and so on. So if you're in a state like California, where the base um, funding for kids in public schools is about 8,000 a year, if wealthy families are spending another 7,500 on top of that, you can see how both the investment in time and in dollars uh, in young people's education is double and serves as a driver for some of the inequality that we see. So um, going to the slide, uh, I'm going to quickly um, sort of go over um, each of these models, which is covered in a chapter in the book that, that Eric mentioned. Uh, but I won't go into the details. What I want to do is really just frame them um, in, in, in sort of the way that you might think of a tree with different concentric rings. Each of these, in turn, has been challenging the notion of education as a school-centric, um, teacher-focused um, activity 
and one and, and began to think of education as a youth sector issue um, that brings the capacities of families and communities and employers uh, to the task of equity and student-centered learning. So one of the first um, chapters in the book uh, in studies is by Jennifer Davis, uh, who's now at Harvard, um, who studied the evolution of the movement <laughs> in Massachusetts to expand the, the year and, and day, um, uh, and efforts in Massachusetts to uh, support schools to add minutes to the day and uh, days to the year, and to expand summer school as an equity driver and as a way of dealing with structural constraints of schools and, and providing deeper learning opportunities in the state. Um, uh, this allowed for schools to use more block scheduling, made room for project-based learning, and more room for teachers to collaborate in professional development. This alone um, uh, helped um, to begin break some of those uh, silos of, of teaching, but academic learning in this movement is still thought of as the, the main focus of learning um, in the disciplines, and it's still very school-centric. Equity still was about more school time. Um, the other two chapters um, that I'll discuss together, even though they're, they're treated differently um, in the book, uh, separately in, in separate chapters, is the after-school movement and the community schools movement. And one of the things that this, these two uh, compatible movements had is that they really began to challenge the na narrow notions of what learning means. Really thinking of time as a way of providing more uh, civic learning and moral reasoning opportunities, more social emotional learning and attention to the arts, particularly in low-income minority schools, which were being pressured by the accountability system to focus uh, on, on reading and math. Um, these two movements embraced uh, new stakeholders, families, community-based organization, to capture um, resources in those communities on behalf of young people. Um, the Link Learning Career Academies movement did a similar thing, breaking into the, the uh, much harder to change high schools and secondary schools. So there in a, in a chapter by Gary Hochlander focusing on work in Detroit, um, uh, you see that this, the um, effort to bring to the high school new partners, um, challenging the structure of the American high school, linking the academic and vocational parts of the high school together, and then linking the high school to employers, to stakeholders, uh, as educators and as people who can expand the learning of young people, and trying to bring greater coherence between workplace learning, uh, school-based learning, um, and academic learning and technical learning. Still, um, through most of these uh, four um, movements, um, expanding the, the day and year, after school, community schools, link learning, the school is still the focus or the center of, uh, of learning and, and, and driver of, of inequality. The last chapter um, that we have is looking at promised neighborhoods, which is one of many kinds of exemplars of comprehensive community um, initiatives. Um, these take a comprehensive youth sector approach, extending the circle beyond the high school, but also beyond the, the immediate families and neighborhoods, uh, the immediate family and the community of the school to include all public agencies, uh, the touch on young people, um, health, preschool, parks and recreation, police, um, uh, justice, um, taking on multiple schools um, in their zones, um, and taking a more collective impact approach um, using multiple agencies, tapping into community-based organizations, and trying to create greater efficiencies and uh, use of shared data to drive improvement. Um, this last um, uh, type of intervention really examples the, the sort of outer layer of, of a drive to um, 
to take a youth sector approach to equity and to student-centered learning. So the, the thematic um, takeaways from these four uh, efforts, uh, or um, th they exemplify a move to, of schools and um, educators pushing out, um, uh, challenging a school-centric approach, enabling more strategic partners um, in comprehensive programming on behalf of kids and en enabling coherent alignment of school and partners on behalf of young people, and more pushing in as partners and employers outside of the school are finding ways to enter the school and to be partners, real partners, and not just people that get kids handed off to them um, in, in developing the whole child and in tapping into health um, and other resources of the community on behalf of young people uh, more effectively. We, just the other day, I was at a school that was using many of its after school partners to um, get commitments to have them spend um, two or three hours a day in classrooms with young people so that all young people at the school had access to tutoring and mentoring rather than just at, on an opt-in basis in the high school. And this was a real exemplar of a sort of mature sort of pushing in of communities into the DNA of school. I'm gonna stop there um, uh, and I'm gonna hand it over to Marisa to talk about the, the balance of the chapters in the book and of studies that really focus on you know, how kids learn and how these um, interventions can really advance uh, student-centered learning. Perfect. Uh, well, first, thank you, Eric, for that intro and, and the book plug. I appreciate that. I think, uh, um, yeah, as Jorge explained, I'm, I'm going to try my best to share in a few minutes some of the remaining themes of the book and do my best to capture some of the really rich work uh, accomplished by a number of scholars that are contributors to this book and how they use their expertise in the learning sciences to demonstrate how these models um, reflect some of the broad principles of learning theory and work to reclaim learning from these narrow conceptualizations. So the model Jorge has described and the cross-cutting themes allow us to better understand the potential of ELT as an equity strategy and, and as well as some of the, the challenges. So focusing first on the potential, um, we will, uh, I'll attempt to share how these approaches really aim to place students at the center of their learning and um, how they've created structural changes that go deeper than merely adding more time to the school day or year, as Jorge pointed out. Um, and in doing so, they really call into question some of our basic assumptions about school, in quotes, as a physically bounded place with precise start and stop time. So the, the models accomplish this in a number of ways, all of which place students at, at the center of their learning. So first, you know, I don't know that we are on the right uh, slide. I think we need to go out a couple slides more, if I'm following. Next one, more. There you go. Here we go. Is that right? Yes. Okay, so first, Student culture is seen as a resource to the everyday practices and routines of these schools. Within these approaches, families are often invited into the classroom to share their expertise and knowledge. Families, as Jorge uh, pointed out, are invited in to be part of student learning. So whereas in traditional schools, student funds of knowledge are often silent, ELT approaches create opportunities to leverage and value the learning and the routines of students, families, and of cultures. And by leveraging these everyday experiences and practices, these models can contribute to a greater sense of belonging and identity. 
Children learn best, as we know, when they feel cared for, when they feel known, and when who they are is both uh, celebrated and recognized by the educators in the building. And these, uh, these environments, these learning environments provide young people opportunities as such to develop their identity as learners. The second, they expand the focus of learning in a couple of ways. And Jorge touched on one of these. Uh, first, they consider how the whole body, the whole family, and the whole community need to be supported as part of learning and schooling. There's recognition, for example, that students will get so much more from an innovative curriculum or from an engaging or from engaging instruction uh, when they have access to stable housing, food, and health care, for example. Uh, second, as what has pointed out, these approaches really broaden what counts as learning to move beyond core academics to reach the social, emotional learning, and the mindset that contribute to students' learning and their lifelong success. Third, third uh, these approaches connect students' world to, um, they connect students' world through increased adult interaction. So these ELT approaches can create additional learning opportunities for students by increasing their adult interaction, allowing them to develop relationships with adults beyond the classroom and to learn from the experiences of these adults. And you know, as I mentioned, students learn best when they feel cared for and, and, and feel a connection to others. But through these different adult interactions, students are also able to effectively bridge their different worlds and navigate them with greater ease and comfort. Uh, for example, uh, students are able to maintain their commitment to their family sphere, to, the, to their work sphere perhaps, and to, and to school. And there are real learning advantages for students when we acknowledge that schools are not isolated from these other institutions, and when we invite adults to come into the school space. So when other adults come into these school spaces, students are able to make the, more easily able to make the connections as they observe and experience adults interact as well between these spheres, when they see them collaborate, and often broker their needs um, through these collaborations. Some important learning takes place in these uh, experiences at these school sites in watching these interactions. So fourth, and this is often accomplished through open-ended tasks, expanded learning type approaches are authentically situated. So authentically situated learning environments make learning more meaningful for the student. Learning reflects actual practice. So when young people are provided an opportunity, for example, to engage in practical activities or to solve actual problems, the learning that happens or has to happen shifts, and students have to figure out how to adjust their work to adjust to that concept. So very much like what we as adults do in the workplace. So engaging in these sorts of open-ended, project-based or problem-based projects really allows young people to solve problems in a way that reflects real life. Um, and youth organizing, a chapter within the book focuses on youth organizing, um, provides a really great example of this when organizing groups allow students to engage in these open-ended tasks where they need to collaborate, to work on authentic goals, and to participate in real domains, adult domains. And the fifth point here is related to the fourth, 
These approaches also invite participants to play mature and meaningful roles. So within these approaches, students often learn by doing. They learn how to participate in different settings and learn from those with more experience within those settings and to develop the skills that enable them to stop, to step into those more mature roles. So they are often invited to use the tools of experts and to learn from experts directly. And when students have access to mature practices, they, be, they can begin to connect their identities to those practices. So in link learning, for example, students work in a hospital setting or in engineering firms, architectural firms, and they can begin to envision themselves in those roles as doctors, as nurses, as engineers, or as architects. So if we want our learning to, if we want our children to access these deep and meaningful opportunities and to learn in these deep and meaningful ways, changing the structures and uses of time in school might be a really good move. So um, the big question is what is preventing us from doing this as a, at a systems level? So the chapters highlight some of the biggest challenges. And uh, one of the biggest challenges is whether or not we have evidence that these approaches can meet the needs of our most vulnerable youth. And while we're starting to collect this evidence, in fact, it's, it's kind of a no-brainer that for English learners, for example, um, who need to acquire English as well as their uh, regular curriculum, as well as for students with some of the greatest needs, how time is spent is critical. We also know that we need to move away from drill and kill approaches that have been shown to be ineffective. We need to move to strategies where all students can find relevance, meaning, engagement in their learning. So to ensure that these approaches can meet the needs of our most vulnerable youth, we have to begin to develop accountability mechanisms and a broad set of indicators of good schools and student success that force us to pay attention to the conditions, the processes, and the results that go far beyond standardized test scores. So that's, that's one of the challenges. Second, funding. Uh, policies that add time should also provide increased funding for schools serving students with the greatest needs. So if we look at some of the traditional or charter schools that uh, have added time to their school day, they have required uh, additional resources. And some ELP models that are designed to function within the same funding levels as the traditional school calendar, these are largely confined to states that currently provide higher levels of funding. So we, we have to acknowledge this and, and meet it straight on. So what, what I think is very interesting about some of the approaches that we have highlighted in the book is not necessarily that they're doing something new or something unprecedented, but that they represent really creative adaptations to a decreased investment in public goods. So uh, if we look at the community school or promise school model where um, and where these schools exist, if there's in you know in these places where affordable health care, for example, is unavailable, these approaches bring these much needed resources to the school site. So if we want to integrate these learning principles into systems rather than leaving them as one-offs. We really need to address the, the issue of equitable funding. So um, 
that's a hard one to that, that's a challenge, but it it's one we gotta acknowledge. Um, the third, a chapter was devoted to who has access to these opportunities. And these authors explored the influence of the spatial spatial structure, geographic, place, space, and transportation as as uh, opportunity or an obstacle to access. And these authors using L Los Angeles as a case study found that spatial inequalities access impact access to these opportunities. Um, not surprising, but in poor neighborhoods, for example, while students might have increased access to publicly funded after school programming, the families in these neighborhoods continue to encounter challenges in accessing other types of enrichment activities that contribute to student learning and well-being. So, Disparities in accessing these opportunities are byproducts, not surprisingly, by the urban landscape that reflects and reinforce social and economic inequalities. So planning for these approaches and implementation also requires planning for the spatial structure. And we have to consider issues such as bus routes, access to public education, parents' work schedules, safety of the neighborhood, et cetera. Uh, fourth challenge is we have to acknowledge that learning time includes adult learning time. We need teachers to be viewed as more than just implementers of these approaches, but as individuals with the experience and expertise to really determine how best to meet the needs of their students families, and communities. And to do so, that requires time for teachers to learn from each other, to increase their knowledge, to share their knowledge, and to lead and innovate, to lead these approaches and, and really tailor them to best meet the needs of their, their stakeholders. So the, the last challenge is uh, probably the biggest one here. And it's that uh, persistent education inequality reflects more than just a technical failure. And it can't be uh, remedied through a technical fix. It's sustained by prevailing cultural norms and, politi and politics. So disparities are often seen by the public as expected or normal. We've normalized the idea, for example, that young people from culturally advantaged or more affluent groups succeed at higher rates than students from other backgrounds. So lessening inequality means new thinking and new policies alongside technical remedies. So we need both new practices and policies. To accomplish this, as, as Jorge identified earlier, we need both insiders who could use their expertise to create these, these innovations uh, to work alongside outsiders, including those most marginalized by the system, uh, so that we can make the cultural and political landscape welcoming to the adoption, the implementation, and the sustainability of the practices and structures that can push our entire system towards equity. So what we've tried to demonstrate in these collection of, in the collection of chapters in the book is that these approaches offer more than just a technical fix or an innovation. The core focus of these approaches is to use ideas and tools that are accessible and available to drive system and policy-driven improvement, to provide the learning resources, the learning opportunities, the learning opportunities, and the relationships 
um, to our children who suffer the most from social and economic inequality. And I will leave it there. Fantastic. Thank you both. It's um, a couple of comments and then I'd like to turn it over to some uh, to the folks that have attended this call. If you have a question that you'd like to pose, please uh, enter it into the chat function at the bottom there is directed on the screen. Um, and then we'll be curating those and, and, and funneling them off to uh, Dr. Um, Velasco and Saunders here in a second, but a couple of comments. One, I'm just, in both of your remarks, I'm struck by what a powerful confluence this is of multiple um, important areas in research that include, at least in my quick read, um, the need to pay closer attention to college career and civic preparedness, um, the need to focus on student voice and agency, um, deeper learning outcomes that prepare students for real life work, real life experiences, um, those sort of quote unquote soft skills that we now know are not soft, they're actually crucial for um, being able to engage others and work collaboratively in complex work environments and be prepared for uh, a shifting field of employment opportunities that seem to change at a moment's notice. Um, the anytime, anywhere focus on time that you're using here, I think is particularly important as communities bemoan and have for a long time um, the two o'clock to six o'clock hours and the summer melt. The same folks that are often complaining about how that is a, a time that is right for, particularly for secondary level students to often get in trouble or be wasting time and the summer melt. Um, those are some of the same folks who aren't ponying up to kind of contribute and establish structures that would create more opportunities for time to be used and allocated more equitably. So I think that's a poignant point that you all um, brought. Um, I think it's also crucial to think about this from a civic preparedness perspective. And I know that uh, one of our distinguished fellows, Kay Kawashima Ginsburg, who's on the call today, would likely concur that the more opportunities we're giving students to connect to those in their communities um, and see different perspectives upon the same issue and look at how work is constructed and look at how different uh, vocations are made and how communities work together to do everything from paving the streets to building hospitals to making farms run and all of that is really important as kids figure out how to immerse themselves and get a future aspiration into a trajectory. And then the a last couple thing here that um, how we assess school quality needs to include the extent to which we're creative about our use of time and how that use of time is constructed equitably. That's actually producing um, more equitable outcomes, not just the same status quo. Um, and then uh, two tiny last points that um, we often talk about wraparound services. And this really seems to me to be about wraparound time that we're really thinking about um, moving the way that we use and think about time and wrapping it around the day rather than just around that 7.30 in the morning to two o'clock in the afternoon kind of school day. Um, and I would suspect that there are significant voting blocks that claim to be neglected right now across this country that would be well served by much of what you're advocating. So I think there's an interesting political play there if it's, if it's framed in a way that would be um, digestible and useful for those who set policy. So. Just a point there. Um, so uh, chat, comments, questions. Um, I'm looking at the chat feature here. Melanie, did any rise up? If not, I might kick it to a few of the fellows to pose a few questions. Okay, so here's what I would like to do. Um, there are several of our students at the Center Distinguished Fellows who are on the call, and I know that at least um, two of them have areas of research and overlap that connect well with the field. And I want to send it out to either Kay or to um, Michelle Kulik um, to see if there's anything that resonates for you here or a question that you might pose. So first, Kay, I'll put, I'm sorry to put you on the spot there, but is there anything that you'd like to ask of our presenters? Yeah. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah, great. 
Hello? Oh, okay, great. Sorry, I'm on the phone and the computer. So thank you so much for this presentation. I resonate with what you're saying so, so, so much, probably because we might both work in sort of a youth organizing and engagement field. The question that I put to ask, if I can, is really in your experience, what can drive system level change in how the school systems and adult community leaders and even community organizations that provide these programs move from measuring what's easiest to measure and report to what's really meaningful outcome measures that drives those three successes, whether it's college, career, or civic life. I'm seeing a lot of, you know, we're measuring this because it's required and it's the easiest thing to measure. It's handy, but oftentimes it's misaligned with what you're talking about, which I agree, and it's also very uninclusive, I might say. So what, how do you sort of see the drivers of that shift when it's successfully shifted? Jorge, I, I think your experience with the core district might be, uh, might help in that response. Yeah, I, I, I was thinking of a, of a two-part response. One that is sort of an insider structural problem with particularly districts in being able to support change at the school and community. Yeah. And the other one is uh, uh, an, an outsider piece. And, and, and Marisa, maybe you could tell us a little bit about the work that Inner City Struggle and Community Coalition have been doing in pushing from the outside uh, yeah. the issues that she raised about measures that are meaningful to, um, to families and to communities about success, but also measures and data that's important to teachers for learning, as opposed for, to, for accountability. Um, at the top of the system, more and more, as we're spending time with districts, as opposed to just uh, retail with schools, one of the key mm -hmm. challenges we're finding is that um, even high reform districts often are very, well, they're bureaucracies. And, and because of that, what often you see is that student supports a variety of ways are put in a division of services, a, divi a services division with a uh, deputy superintendent in charge of services. Mm -hmm. The curriculum and instruction and accountability are often in two other divisions with different uh, deputy superintendents, curriculum and instruction in one, uh, data and accountability in another, and yeah. the facilities, the people who actually are going to make it possible for schools, say, to have the janitors there after three to deal with the um, liability issues and, and security issues of opening up the school to the community across the day, across the year, are also in a, in a fourth division. And certainly reform will happen in curriculum or it will happen in services, but they won't be working together with facilities and services uh, in a, in a, at the district level. And so the schools get very conflicting messages and often there's, you know, you have a superintendent who says, yes, let's see how we can work better with our families and communities. And then you have a facilities division that says, oh no, you've got to lock your doors at three. And so um, it really takes convening districts and helping them make a shift from being account, uh, being totally focused on, um, on compliance to rules and being more uh, focused on, day, on learning to work collaboratively across divisions in the service of student-centered learning. So, at the district level, getting breaking these cycle, these these um, uh, these bureaucratic um, silos has been a real uh, inhibitor uh, in helping to build those capacities at the school level. And Marisa, maybe you can talk a little bit about how the organizing work has, has at the other end worked to um, to break those silos. Yeah, I, I think in um, there are some great examples in. Los Angeles, where a number of community-based organizations that have a broad base of students and uh, families as members, they have worked as outsiders to really push the district in broadening 
what counts and what is measured as student, student and school level success. And um, oftentimes, and this I think is pretty unusual, those organizations have a seat at the decision making table. Um, I don't know that that happens too often in other districts. It didn't happen overnight. These are organizations that have a long history in the city and you know, their efforts to push the district as outsiders started small. But over time, uh, I think they have really, the district has really grown to um, both acknowledge the expertise and the experiences of these organizations and understand that they have knowledge that they need to bring into the decision making process and, mm -hmm. and have indeed taken a lot of knowledge to create, for example, a graduate profile in LAUSD that moves beyond you know, these test scores to really understand what it is we want as a graduate from this district and to work alongside schools, communities to make sure students are all graduating, ready for college, career, and, and life, civic life beyond, beyond high school. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's an example. Um, you know, but another thing uh, in your question, um, <laughs> makes me think of the importance of researchers in uh, producing these uh, evidence-based proof points, right? And, yeah. Yeah. Um, but even with the evidence, pushing cultural and political norms is so challenging. So I think two months ago, and Jorge, you might know this better than I do, but uh, Senate bill, was proposed 328 that would change the start time for middle school and high school. So based on two decades worth of science, we know that for young uh, people, starting school before 830 is just a bad idea. We know this. And if we could shift the start and stop times of school or really reconsider you know, the, the boundaries of school, we can make a big difference in learning outcomes. Um, it didn't make it. it. It will apparently be revisited in a couple of uh, next year, I understand. But even mm -hmm. with all of the evidence, it is so difficult to push on these cultural and political norms. This is a good segue to a systems level leader that happens to be one of our distinguished fellows. Um, Dr. Michelle Kulik um, has a question I think that would, would help us move the conversation um, in some good directions that would be helpful to her fantastic work in Hartford. So, Michelle. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Yep. Okay. Um, so, so much of what both of you just spoke about uh, really resonated um, with me and with the work that we're doing here in Hartford. Um, we are engaging in a process right now to redesign uh, the entire school district and to address um, some of the deep um, inequities um, and, um, you know, performance issues throughout the district. and. Um, we, throughout this process, we are engaging with um, all of the stakeholders and um, making sure that community partners and parents and, and corporate um, and businesses and, you know, all stakeholders have a really authentic um, place at the table to be co-creators of this new redesign. Um, so I would love to hear more about your thinking around um, the embedding of community partners into schools um, because we're, you know, we're grappling with this. We've identified family and community partnerships, like many people, as, um, as a, you know, priority for our school district. But we've actually listed it in this process as one of our guiding principles that we need to figure this out, you know, that um, 
the school day, you know, our old paradigm of the school day being, you know, 8 o'clock or what have you till 3 o'clock, and that the schools own that time and uh, that community partners and parents own, you know, the rest of the time. Um, our board is actually using the language of blurring the lines between school and parents and community so that, um, so that we're co-creators and, um, and also providing supports and services together. So um, I would love to hear more about, um, you know, some of the practices that you've come across to blur those lines um, and, and just, you know, pick your brain around that a little bit. Well, you know, one, one place to start is uh, a, a, a different project that we, we have here at the, um, at the Gardner Center around integrated student support, particularly in the high schools and middle schools. Um, I, I imagine as a system leader, you're, you are acutely aware that you already have lots and lots and lots of partners in your schools uh, or involved or who want to be involved. Um, and often those are community-based organizations and intermediaries and contractees that, that provide either sports or dance or uh, um, tutoring services or college and career readiness services, usually uh, in the after school as part of Beyond the Bell or, or your after school um, partners and interventions. Um, the challenge that high, particularly high school and middle school leaders say is not, not involving uh, these partners, but in helping to make sure that rather than a relay race where teachers have students in the morning or, and in classrooms and then they hand them off to tutors and mentors and after school partners <laughs> later, the real challenge is helping the under, after school partners know um, deeply what the content is of the academic standards and also what the social and emotional learning skills that you're trying to cultivate during the day and also for the teachers to know what the strengths and weaknesses are of the partners in school. In, in one school uh, that I mentioned earlier uh, in San Francisco, um, the approach they've taken is that they've asked all of their after-school tutors and, and mentors and, and college and career-ready um, partners to spend at least two hours in classrooms um, during the day with teachers as student success coaches. This particular school, in the morning session, they, are, they have 90-minute blocks and then traditional blocks in the afternoon. And what the, it initially the teacher struggled with, well, who is this person in my classroom and, and how are they going to advance my work? But what we're finding from teachers is, oh, um, now I have somebody who can tutor my kids in pull out in real time in the classroom. The partners are saying by watching teachers work in the classroom with students, they understand more deeply what the instructional uh, standards are that are being applied in the classroom and how to help students um, in tutoring sessions. And the teachers say that having this extra caring adult in the classroom for even just a couple of hours a day really sort of builds their instructional capacity in the classroom and students feel the, the coherence. When we interview students, one of the things that they see is that when they see adults working together and learning from each other, they see that as modeling, and then they they um, are um, they become much more motivated to learn when they see that their teachers are learning, and they're learning in a very dedicated and and um, uh, 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 a mindful way. At this particular school, the teachers have a common planning time on Wednesday afternoon, and many of the after-school partners then will teach courses in, on Wednesday afternoon that are around uh, applying for college or getting ready for a job or um, uh, life skills courses, uh, uh, tutoring courses. Um, and um, during those periods um, leading up to Wednesday afternoon, they often see teachers and after school partners in classrooms collaborating, uh, doing uh, co code um, creating courses and with and students say wow this is hard um, 
our teachers are actually taking time to learn themselves. And that, um, that is an important modeling for them that really sort of animates their own learning. So that's one example I, I can offer. Wow, Fantastic, I wanna so get much. to, a, yeah, great. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, I wanna get to a question from um, Barbara Endel, who is a senior director at Jobs for the Future. She's done some amazing work in accelerating opportunity initiatives in the Accelerating Opportunity Initiative. And it's particularly um, connected to the post-secondary transitions and community college work. And she's asking, um, how essential it is to help students become college ready. Um, and she's asking, do you have any exemplary post-secondary partners who have made intentional system changes around the themes that you've presented? And if so, where were those? Uh, so, yes. Um, and I think they're most evident in, um, some, they're, they're most evident in some of the approaches, in particular those that focus at the high school level. So link learning and um, community schools and promise neighborhood approaches, higher ed institutions, community colleges, uh, four-year colleges are really important partnerships in, in the implementation of these approaches. Oh, did I lose you all? Nope, you're there. Hello? I think I lost my video, but can you still hear me? Yep, sound loud and clear. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so, yes, I, I, we did not explore uh, or detail the importance of these particular partnerships, but they are instrumental in a number of them. Yeah, I, I, I would add too that in many of these examples, um, frequently K-12 will say, well, we have looked at our assessments and our kids are ready. And often then uh, post-secondary institutions will say, well, you know, they don't, they're not testing into our credit bearing courses and they're not as ready as you think they are. But when you actually bring them to, when you bring say math teachers in the college and math teachers in the uh, community college together, what you find is that their, their human problems internal to the systems where maybe they're using the wrong assessments, maybe they have the wrong conceptualization of readiness, maybe um, they are, um, uh, they, maybe they're, they're, not, they're not using the right um, messaging to students. And through the process of inquiry and working together, um, they begin to uh, co-construct um, pathways that are more effective for their students and to address students' needs better. Um, mm -hmm. And so the, the real insight there is creating opportunities for, rather than looking at just the students and saying there's something wrong with our students that they're not connecting, um, forging, greater connections between post-secondary educators and K-12 educators around inquiry, around their preparation, around their assessments, around their pathways has been the more profitable route um, uh, for helping students is, is um, forging that adult inquiry across those barriers, uh, bridges. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. So um, we are at the top of the hour, which means we need to wrap it up. Um, these are always hard to stop these conversations. I wish that we were all, you know, passing around large plates of salad here soon and ordering glasses of wine and could go much deeper. But this is, this is a virtual <laughs> meeting and we'll have to save that for another opportunity. Um, cannot thank um, Dr. Saunders and uh, De Velasco enough for their fantastic insights here. Um, again, want to recommend um, their new book with Harvard Ed Press um, and highlight the fact that so much of the work that we do within the Student Centered Learning Research Collaborative is to take the kind of findings that um, our presenters are highlighting here, the kinds of things that researchers are noting in multiple arenas of inquiry across the country, and in particular our research teams and distinguished fellows in order to translate that into actual practices and policy and cross-sector conversations that move the needle on equity 
and that get greater uptake and scale of these practices that increasingly are shown to be really successful, particularly for kids who are most underserved. So if you are part of this call because you'd like to know more, please stay close, stay connected to us, sign up for alerts. There's a lot more that will be coming out in the next several months. Um, and if, if and when you want to know some more, please feel free to drop us a line at rcsubmit at jff.org. Um, with that, I'd like to thank our two presenters for their ongoing work on behalf of um, the field and the populations that most need it. And I wish you all a pleasant evening on Thursday, a great Friday, and a great weekend. Have a good one, everyone. Thanks. Thanks. Bye. Thanks, everybody.